Hi everyone, I'm back for another video and in today's video I would like to explain how any large language model works. So nowadays of course everyone knows uh, ChatGPT from OpenAI that really um, yeah, made uh, the AI models uh, which we are working with for several years uh, mainstream uh, because now it finally uh, it has some very useful uh, properties. Um, but actually, back in 2019, um, OpenAI released GPT-2, uh, which was at the time yeah, one of the largest language models out there. Um, and so, yeah, it's still available on Hacking Face. As you can see, it's still quite a popular model. Um, and in today's video, I would like to just explain a bit more in detail how such a model works because actually all of these large language models that we have nowadays uh, including for example the very um, trending mistral and mixtral models from mistral.ai which are open source large language models which you can just uh, download and fine-tune on your own data they're all available on the hugging face hub um, for example llama 2 as well um, from meta they're all um, having the exact or mostly the, the same architecture as the original uh, GPT-2 model. So that's why I would like to um, explain a bit more in detail how such a model works, because actually, as you will see, the math behind them is not that difficult. Um, you could even uh, view it as high school math because the, the math that I got at university was actually more difficult than the math behind uh, such a transform model. So I actually already have uh, a YouTube video on how a transform model works, both at inference time um, and training time. So for that, um, I refer to this video, but this one yeah, really goes in detail into how uh, autoregressive generation works, which means uh, generating tokens one after the other, and also how such a model is trained. But in this video, I would like to go a bit more in depth into like the actual architectural blocks of this model because I think in this video yeah I just had like a box for the encoder of a transform model and a decoder without l actually explaining what's going on within these uh, blocks but so in this video uh, I'm gonna go in more depth and specifically I'm gonna go inside the decoder of a transform model because all of these large language models they are only the decoder parts of a transform model. So the original attention is all you need paper from Google, which introduced the transformer neural network architecture. Um, the original transformer consists of both an encoder part, the left part, and then a decoder. But all of these large language models only consist of the decoder part. So that's what I'm gonna uh, explain in this video. All right. And so, yeah, let me actually draw a figure that looks a bit like this one. Uh, but with Excalidraw. So the first thing that uh, you need to know is that, let's say this is our transformer decoder uh, model. So a decoder only uh, transform model. So you can say yeah, GPT-2, Mistral, Llama, they all have this same architecture. Um, the first thing that actually happens here is uh, we start from some text. Um, so we also call this nowadays a prompt, like for example, hello world, my name is, that could be the prompt that we feed, that we want to feed to the model. So the first thing that actually happens is we use what is called a tokenizer. Um, so a tokenizer is uh, yeah, basically an object that will turn our text into what we call input IDs. And the input IDs is what we actually feed to our model. Because if you go, for example, to the documentation of uh, GPT-2 or any other large language model in the Transformers library, you will find the input IDs everywhere. Um, and so as you can see, these input IDs, um, they actually represent integer indices in the vocabulary of the transform model. So let me explain that by opening a new Google Colab notebook. 
uh, Google Colab nowadays already comes pre-installed with the Hugging Face Transformers library, so we don't need to install it anymore. Uh, let's just load a GPT-2 model. So for that, I'm going to use the auto tokenizer class and the auto model for causal language modeling classes. And then I'm going to load both the tokenizer and the model from the hub. So this is going to load the um, weights of the pre-trained GPT-2 model uh, from Hugging Face. Um, and so, yeah, let's say our prompt is, hello world, my name is. So the first thing we need to do is uh, prepare this for the model. So for that, we're going to use the tokenizer. We need to specify that we want to return PyTorch tensors here. And let's print them out. And I'm also going to add here some titles. Load model and tokenizer. Prepare prompt for the model. All right, so what we get back here is this integ integer list. Um, and the shape of that is of shape patch size uh, sequence length, or also called number of tokens. So in this case, if we print the shape, you will see that this is of shape one six because we have a batch size of one because we're only feeding a single text through our tokenizer, um, and uh, the uh, sorry the sequence length, the number of tokens is six in this case. So the text has been turned into six tokens. So you might wonder what these numbers here mean, or what they represent. So actually we can um, turn them back into text as follows using the decode method of the tokenizer. Uh, so in this case, for example, the text hello world, my name is, uh, has the following tokens. And so these numbers here, you can just find them uh, in the vocabulary of the GPT-2 model. So if you go here to the files and versions tab, you will find the vocabulary here in the JSON file. So this is quite a large file. That's because, yeah, the vocabulary is quite large. We have, so a mapping basically between individual tokens and their corresponding numbers, which is just an index in the vocabulary. Um, and so here, for example, token with ID 31,373 corresponds to the string hello and so on. Uh, it can happen that a single word, for example, is tokenized into multiple tokens. You will see that if I would use my name. Uh, Niels is not a unique token in the vocabulary, so this gets tokenized into two separate tokens. Uh, so yeah, usually a word can be mapped to multiple tokens. There's not a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, but so yeah, these input IDs uh, is actually what we're going to feed to our models and so these are always of shape batch size sequence length um, and so in our example um, here we have a batch size of one and a sequence length or number of tokens of six uh, so yeah the reason i'm gonna print out these shapes or add them here to the figure is because it's quite important to think in terms of the shapes of the tensors that we're gonna feed to our model like in this case the input ids are what we call a long tensor. So if you would print out the type, you'll see that this is a torjot long tensor, which actually means that it's only storing integer uh, numbers. It's not gonna store any float floating uh, point numbers um, because the weights of the model are actually floating point numbers. And we can actually also print out the vocabulary size of a model. Uh, so there are about 50,000 tokens in the vocabulary of the GPT-2 model which basically uh, represent the entire language. All right, so the next step is to um, basically forward perform a forward pass. So for that, uh, the only thing you need to do is write the following. And then you will get a dictionary out. So let's print that out. And we get two things here, logits and pass key values. All right, most important thing for now are the logits. So what are logits? Uh, as you can see, they are just numbers. And we also call logits oftentimes the unnormalized scores. 
Um, so let's print out the shape of these logits. Well, the shape is of shape, patch size, the sequence length, so number of tokens, and then the vocabulary size of the model. That's what we get out. Um, all right, and so uh, let's actually see what we can do with these logits. So logits are also called unnormalized scores. So um, logits, you can view them as what the model might think comes next after hello world, my name is, because a model like GPT-2 or any other large language model has been pre-trained on predicting the next token. So basically it's gonna make a prediction of what of those 50,000 tokens in vocabulary of the model might come next after the sequence, hello world, my name is. So basically after these six tokens, what should come next? Um, and so, yeah, the logits, we call them unnormalized scores because yeah, they are not normalized at all. Um, they are just, as you can see, numbers that don't sum up to one, for example, as in probabilities, uh, they're just not normalized. But uh, we can actually uh, see what the model's prediction here would be for the next token. So for that, uh, what we can do is basically just look at the logits of the final token in our sequence. So in this case, the, the last token is the token with ID 318, which corresponds to the string S. Uh, and so let's look at those logits. So we're gonna just take here the last logits. Uh, so the shape of that is going to be um, batch size 1 uh, and then the vocabulary size. Uh, we can actually see that. Because, yeah, we're only looking at the final token in the sequence. All right. And then what we can actually do is um, get the next token ID by performing the arcmax operation. So in PyTorch, uh, the arcmax operator, oh, there went something wrong there. Oh, something wrong with my internet. And we're back. Sorry for that. Um, so the arcmax operator basically uh, returns the indices of the maximum value of all the elements in the input tensor. So that's actually exactly what we need. So if you would um, basically look here at the highest logits over the entire vocabulary size, we would need to do torch.argmax and then logits and the dimension over which we want to take the argmax operator. So in this case, it's the last dimension, which in Python you can do by typing minus one, which is the last. Um, and then we basically get the next token ID. Um, Wait, I'm doing something wrong here. Yeah, it should be next token logits, of course. Yeah, and so what we get here is the token with ID uh, 1757. So let's um, convert that back using our tokenizer. Uh, next token ID. Yeah, I'm printing zero here because this is still of shape batch as one. So in this case, it corresponds to the uh, string john so in this case gpt2 has decided that after hello world my name is then john should follow all right so in our figure here what we basically did was um we prepared the input ids for the model which are of shape batch size sequence length and then we feed those to the model and out are these logit values logits and they are of shape patch size sequence length uh, vocabulary size and then what we did was we basically looked at the next token logits so these are of shape batch size one vocab size and then, yeah, we performed an argmax operator on that, on the final dimension of the vocabulary, and then it printed out the token ID uh, 1757. 
and this corresponds to the token John. All right. So that's what we call a single forward pass through the GPT-2 or any other large language model. So we started from some prompt, from some text. We used the tokenizer to convert that text into what we call input IDs. And these get turned somehow using this transformer decoder model into logits, which are the unnormalized scores. And then we yeah, looked at the logits of the final token in that sequence. We performed an argmax and okay, we get we get a certain token out. Okay, and that's how a single forward pass <coughs> works. All right, but um, so in my previous video, I explain in a lot more detail how we are then generating the next token. Basically what happens is we add John back to our input prompt. So here we would have, hello world, my name is John. We again turn that back into input IDs. Um, we feed that through our model, we get logits out. Again, we look at the logit of the final token. We perform an argmax operator and we get a certain token prediction. And we perform this process over and over again. And that's how autoregressive generation works. Um, so yeah, I have the other YouTube video if you want to know more about it. Um, but in this video, I would like to go in a bit more detail, like how this transformer decoder works internally, how these input IDs get turned into logits. Um, and for that, what I'm gonna do is, I'm basically gonna go into the code base of the Hugging Face Transformers library, which is, yeah, a, pop, a popular library containing a lot of state-of-the-art uh, models uh, like GPT-2. Um, and so what we're going to do here is going into the implementation of the GPT-2 model. So this is defined in the modeling GPT-2.py file. Uh, so in this case, we need to look at the GPT-2 language modeling head model, which is actually the model that we are using in this uh, notebook. You will see that if you type the class. So that's what we are going to investigate today. And so as you can see right here, it consists of a transformer attribute and a language modeling head attribute. Um, okay, and so I'm going to actually draw that now in a bit more detail. So this is just a bigger box, but now we're going to go in a bit more detail, like how we start from input IDs. Um, and yeah, get logits out. Uh, all right. So let's see. The first thing that happens, let's go to the GPT-2 model class. What we have here is some embedding layers. Then we have a dropout layer. And then we have a module list of GPT-2 blocks followed by a layer norm layer. All right. So that's the first thing I'm going to draw. Uh, so basically we start with two embedding layers. So we have an n.embedding in layer. And then we have another one. And then we, after these two embedding layers, we have a dropout layer. Yeah, this one I'm gonna not include in my figure for now because that's actually not that important. Uh, and then we have a sequence of GPT-2 blocks. So that's something I'm gonna add in my figure here. So yeah, it's actually um, repeating quite a bit these GPT-2 blocks uh, in total as we will see uh, we will have 12 of these GPT-2 blocks. You can actually also see that by typing model.config.number of hidden layers because these GPT-2 blocks are also typically called GPT-2 layers. Um, and so a transformer model um, repeats these layers or blocks. Um, and so in the case of GPT-2, we have 12 of these blocks, but yeah, for larger models, like for example, uh, a recent one that was released uh, was the Mixtral model from Mistral AI. If we look at the number of layers that this one has, it's gonna be more than 12. It's gonna be, yeah, it's 32 in this case. 
and yeah, models like GPT-4, for example, have, I think, at least 80 uh, layers or yeah, blocks. All right, and then after the GPT-2 blocks, we have a layer norm. That's something I'm also going to add to my figure. So then we have a layer norm. Yeah, I'm still learning how uh, Excalidra works. All right, and then after that, well, the GPT-2 model has been defined entirely. Uh, but if we go back to the GPT-2 language model head model there, we still have a language modeling head, which is a linear layer. So that's the final thing I need to add to my figure. Actually, I can again copy this. Uh, so this is the language modeling head, also called in in dot linear. Uh, well, it's implemented using an in in dot linear layer in PyTorch. So yeah, each of these layers you can just find them in the documentation of PyTorch. So for example, an embedding layer, uh, and so on. All right, and this is actually all the things that are involved in going from input IDs to uh, logits. Um, but yeah, let's go in a bit more depth. So for that, I'm actually gonna go here into VS Code and I'm gonna go into the GPT-2 file. And I'm gonna just write uh, a script here where I'm gonna just copy over the code that I use in my notebook. So we're gonna load the model and then we're gonna prepare the prompt uh, for a model and we're gonna feed them through it and we're gonna see what what's actually calculated inside the GPT-2 model. Uh, all right, so let me just write, uh, run this. So what we should get out are logits and pass key values. Um, but of course, yeah, the pass key values is not something to worry about for now. I uh, probably need to um, create a different video for that. Uh, for now, let's only care about the logits. And so these have a shape of batch size, sequence length, um, vocabulary size. So one, six, 50,257. All right. So uh, yeah, the first thing that happens um, so if we start from the input IDs here, the first thing that happens is a embedding layer. So if you go here to the GPT-2 model class, the very first thing that we're gonna do is turn these input IDs into input embeddings using an embedding layer. That's what's happening here in the forward pass. So here, forward takes in the input IDs. So basically we're gonna start here. Let me maybe draw it here as well. So we start from the input IDs and we feed them to our first embedding layer. And so this embedding layer, let's call it a word embedding layer, which is implemented using in, in dot embedding. Um, and so this word embedding layer, well, it has a pretty bad name here in the, in the Transformers library. It's just called uh, WTE. I think this stands for word token embeddings. Uh, this is of course not the clearest variable name, but yeah, that's actually the very first thing we are doing. So we basically are going to turn our input IDs here into input embeddings. So that's the first thing that's actually going to happen here. So let me move this a bit. So what the word embedding layer is going to do. is it's gonna turn, um, oh. it's gonna turn the input IDs into what we call input embeddings. Well, here it's called inputs embeds. And let's actually print out their shape. And let's maybe add some more info here, shape of input embeddings. All right, so let's rerun our script. So we start from input IDs, and then as you can see here, they have a shape of batch size, sequence length, and then the embedding dimension of the model. So basically, um, our input embeddings here, they have a shape, uh, batch size, sequence length, 
hidden size, uh, or in this case, one six seven hundred sixty eight. All right, and that's actually the very first thing that happens. So basically what we are gonna do here in our first step, the word embedding layer, is we take these input IDs, so these six tokens, and for each of the six tokens, we're gonna convert them into an embedding, or also called a vector. And so each vector will be a vector containing 768 individual numbers. You can actually also uh, know that by printing model.config.hidden size because the hidden size uh, is basically the size of the embeddings for each of the tokens in model um, and so an embedding layer in pytorch is nothing more than a lookup table so you can actually also see that in the documentation um, an embedding layer is a simple lookup table that stores embeddings of a fixed dictionary and size so basically this embedding layer here, if we would look into a bit more detail, like how it actually works, this is basically just storing, uh, it's basically a matrix you could see, where um, the shape is um, 768 columns and then 50,257 rows. And so every row is one token um, and ev every column is one embedding dimension. And so basically, um, like here, the very first row could look like this. And so on. Uh, that's the embedding of the very first token in vocabulary of the model. And then we have the embedding of the second token in the... Uh, in the vocabulary of the model and so on. And so what we are gonna do here in our very first step is we basically are gonna look up the embedding vector of each of the six tokens in our embedding table here. And then we simply convert them uh, into their corresponding vectors. So yeah, that's what's happening here. So you can actually see the uh, embedding uh, matrix if you type print model dot model.vte.weight, I think. Yeah, if you print this out, uh, you will print out the shape. Uh, wait, GP2 model. Oh yeah, it's what it was called transformer. So this should be called model.transformer.vte.weight. Oh, the shape. So this is gonna print out the shape of our embedding matrix. So it's, well, it's actually, um, as I explained in this figure, so it has 50,000 about 50,000 rows, one for each token in the vocabulary of the model, uh, and then 768 columns, because we're storing 768 numbers for every token in the vocabulary of the model. Um, and so, all right, so we basically use our embedding lookup to turn every token index into a corresponding vector vector, embedding vector. So basically now we have a vector for each of the six tokens, all right using the word embedding layer. So cool, that's a, that's the very first thing that happens. Then the second step that happens is we are gonna add position embeddings to our input embeddings. So that's actually the, the second step here. We are gonna add so position embedding layer. So this is also implemented using an, another embedding. So again, this is just another lookup table. Um, and so the output of that is gonna have the exact same shape so basically, we are going to now feed our input embeddings to this position embedding layer. And what comes out of it, um, we will have the exact same shape. Um, and in this case, we call them hidden states. So let's also call them hidden states here. And so they, they will be of shape batch size, sequence length, hidden size, or in, the, in our case, uh, one six seven hundred sixty eight. And what is the second step here? The push adding the position embeddings to our input embeddings. Well, um, basically, um, for each of our tokens, we have corresponding uh, what we call position IDs. So we can actually print them out. So let's print out um, 
the position IDs. So position IDs are a bit like input IDs, but they just indicate the position of each of the tokens in our input sequence. So they are just yeah going from zero to five in this case because we have six tokens. Um, and so, so what we're gonna do here in our position embedding layer is again, we're gonna, so here we could call this performer lookup. Here we're gonna do the exact same thing. So we're gonna also perform a lookup. Uh, so again here, this will have a embedding matrix. So this is also called a embedding matrix. But this one here is the word embedding matrix, you could say. Um, whereas this one is the position embedding matrix. Um, so the shape of that one will also be will also be having 768 uh, columns because every position embedding is a vector of size 768 but the number of rows is determined by the number of unique positions uh, that the model can handle um, and so or you could also say the maximum sequence length of the model so you can actually print it out by printing uh, max position embeddings I think it's called so in this case it's 1000 24 so that's actually the size of our uh, position embedding matrix and again let's verify that by printing out model.transformer.notwte which stands for the word token embeddings but the wpe which stands for word position embeddings so let's print out that shape uh, so that's going to be normally 1024 yeah by 768 as you can see right here um and so yeah, those position embeddings are going to be added to the input embeddings. So the hidden states here are basically a sum of the input embeddings and the position embeddings. So that's also what we saw here um, in the forward pass. Um, we start from input embeddings, then again here we perform the, the lookup of the word position embeddings uh, these position ids they are created internally inside the model so these don't need to be passed by a user the user only needs to pass input ids to the model position ids are created internally i think you can see that somewhere if position ids is none so you can see right here uh, the model will create those internally based on the input ids <coughs> and then yeah we look them up and then we add them to the input embeddings and then we have our hidden states here all right so now we are at a stage where we have uh, passed through our two embedding layers, one for the uh, tokens and one for the positions of those tokens. And now we have hidden states that are gonna be fed to these sequences of GPT-2 blocks. Uh, yeah, there's still a dropout layer here, but dropout is only used during uh, training where we basically uh, just drop out certain tokens such that the model basically generalizes better. Uh, but nowadays, um, dropout is actually used less and less, especially for training large language models. Um, so the next thing that actually happens after we have created our hidden states, uh, we're gonna have this for loop here where we're gonna basically go over each of these uh, transformer layers or blocks. So these GPT-2 blocks, as I find uh, earlier here. Um, so basically here we have our module list of GPT-2 blocks and we will have config.number in layers of them. So again, let's print out uh, model.config.number of hidden layers. So it's going to be 12 for a GPT-2 model, but uh, other models will have more of them. Um, so here I'm just going to add that we have 12 of them. Um, and so what's happening inside each of these GPT-2 blocks is it's going to take hidden states as an input and it's going to produce hidden states of the exact same shape. So this is just going to be the same. It's going to take in each GPT-2 block or GPT-2 layer, also called transformer layer, is going to take in hidden states of shape, batch size, sequence length, hidden size, and it's going to produce hidden states of the exact same shape. Of course, containing different embeddings. Um, so let's see what's actually happening inside 
one of these GPT-2 blocks. So each GPT-2 block or transformer layer consists of, as you can see, a layer norm, a tension layer, another layer norm. Uh, this is not needed in our case because uh, we're only considering the decoder part of the transformer. So cross attention is not uh, relevant here. And then a multi-layer perceptron. So I'm going to write that down here again in a bit more detail, like how a single GPT-2 block uh, works. So a single GPT-2 block, also called transformer layer. Um, and so, so remember that each GPT-2 block takes in hidden states um, of this shape and is going to produce hidden states of the exact same shape. And inside of that, we have three things. So we have, um, well, actually four things. We have a layer norm layer. Uh, then we have a attention layer. Well, let's just call it attention layer. Then after the attention layer, we have a other layer norm. And then finally, uh, we have a multi-layer perceptron. Well, MLP is short for multi-layer perceptron, also called uh, feed-forward neural network. So that's what inside each uh, GPT-2 block. And all right, so let's just go to the forward path. So as you can see here, the forward of a single GPT-2 block takes in the hidden states because yeah, those are the things we created here before using our word embedding layer and position embedding layer. And now, yeah, we feed those hidden states to our first, our very first GPT-2 block. And the very first thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna pass that to our first layer norm here. So yeah, we could also call this first first layer norm. So that's implemented using an in dot layer norm layer in PyTorch. Again, you can just find the documentation of that in the PyTorch documentation. Um, so that's the first thing that happens, and as you will see, the hidden states shape of the hidden states after first layer norm is just going to be the exact same shape it's going to be batch size uh, sequence length hidden size so one six okay yeah as you can see if, if i add a print statement here it's going to be printed 12 times because we have 12 transformer layers all right cool so yeah that's the first thing that happens um i'm not going to explain what layer norm is layer norm is basically a way to stabilize training of neural networks and basically making sure that they converge faster it's a bit similar to batch normalization which is used a lot in computer vision um but yeah basically it's gonna normalize the embeddings uh, inside our hidden states tensor um and so after our first layer norm yeah we just get hidden states of the exact same shape so then we move on to the attention layer of course, the attention layer is the most complicated thing here. So that's going to require a bit more um, description of, of how it actually works. But you will see that shape of the attention output after performing the uh, self-attention is exactly the same. So it's also just batch size, seems length. So the, the shapes of our tensors are not going to change. They are just going to feed through each of these layers. And then after that, we pass that to another layer norm. So this here is the second layer norm. Um, and then we have our multi-layer perceptron layer, which... Um, oh yeah, I forgot the residual connection. So. Actually, another very important thing in transformers is, so we started from passing our hidden states to our first layer norm here. 
then we move on to passing that to the self-attention layer. But then, the f then what we do is we add a residual. And so the residual here are just the initial hidden states before we apply the layer norm. So basically what, what the residual is, is we take these initial hidden states here and we're gonna add them uh, back to the output of the attention layer which I'm going to call here self-attention layer because it's actually self-attention. Um, so the residual is just going to add uh, the output of the self-attention layer um, with the initial hidden states. And then we feed that back to the second layer norm and then another residual will be added. So here again, uh, we take the, f the hidden states after... Uh, after the self attention and then we're gonna add a second residual so here second residual so a residual is nothing more than so residuals were actually invented in the resnet paper and the idea is actually super simple um, but it's basically just you take your input x uh, and you basically add that back to the output of a certain function. So in our case, we started from our initial input hidden states, but then yeah, we perform these operations, layer norm, self-attention, and then the residual connection is just gonna make sure that those initial hidden states are gonna be added to the output of, the, uh, of these two steps here. And then we do the exact same thing here. We take the existing hidden states at, at that particular step, we perform a second layer norm, multi-layer perceptor, but then we're gonna add those hidden states again to the output of those, those two components. Uh, and residual connections actually are known to um, greatly improve uh, training conversions, as you can see right here also in this in this graph. Um, models just train a lot faster if you add these residual connections, which is why the transformer also uh, decided to, to adopt them. All right, but yeah, so as I was explaining, so we have our first layer, norm layer, and then we move on to the self-attention layer. Okay, and now things get interesting. So let's let's move on to this GPT-2 attention class and let's see what's actually happening inside such a class. Um, all right. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff being implemented here, but I'm just gonna stick to the most important things here and that's actually this function here all right so now i really move to the core logic of a transform model that's the attention or in this case also called self-attention so i need another block for that to explain how a single self-attention layer works all right so remember that after our first layer norm the Shapes of the hidden state are just exactly the same. They are of shape batch size, sequence length, hidden size. So let's take those as the input of the attention layer. All right. So what's happening inside such a uh, layer? So for that, I'm gonna move on here to the fourth. So it stakes in these hidden states. So the first thing that happens here is we're going to create what is called queries, keys, and values. So basically, and this is, yeah, quite special, and this was very innovative in the original Attention is All You Need paper. We're going to create queries, keys, and values from these uh, hidden states. Um, and so let's print out the shape of those queries. the shape of the keys and the shape of the values. So again, if as we have here uh, 12 transform layers, this is actually gonna be printed out for each of the 12 layers, maybe for clarity. Um, let's perhaps add a uh, delimiter print statement to really see the difference between the 12 transformer layers.
yeah, I don't really use uh, debuggers a lot. I always use print statements. Oh, I made a mistake here. To understand how model works and then just printing out the intermediate shapes. So in this case, for example, yeah, we have these 12 transformer layers or GPT-2 blocks. And as you can see here, the queries, keys and values, they have this shape here. So they are not any more of this shape, which we were familiar with for hidden states, but now as you will see, they are of shape, uh, well, let's print them. So 1, 12, 6, and 64. And then the same thing for the keys and the same thing for the values. Uh, okay, and what are these shapes here? Well, actually, that's batch size, uh, sequence length. Uh, sorry, batch size, number of attention heads, sequence length, uh, and then 64 is the head dimension. So, okay, so yeah, we have a batch size of one because we're only sending a single text here uh, through our model, the prompt hello world, my name is. So that's why our batch size is only one. We have 12 attention heads, and that's actually also something you can print out based on the configuration. So model.config.number of attention heads is going to print out 12. Um, okay, my notebook apparently needs some restarting, but I actually can print that out in my test script here. Uh, number of attention heads. I print that out you will see that uh, this particular GPT-2 model um, has 12 attention heads um, and then uh, we have yeah six tokens so that's why we have six here and then 64 is the head dimension so basically uh, what's happening here is um, well it's the core mechanism of the transformer that basically makes it so uh, powerful and so what's happening first is so we have six tokens in our input sequence uh, in this case those tokens were hello world comma and so on um, we turn them into three separate tensors so queries keys and values and so the way we do that uh, self.query let's go back to the queries um, so for that, we use a convolutional 1D layer. Okay, in this case, GPT-2 uses a, GP, uh, a convolutional layer to project them, but actually a lot of other uh, implementations, they just use a linear layer. So I'm gonna draw that here. And I'm gonna call that the query projection layer, which is just implemented using an in and not linear. And then we have the same thing for our keys, so key projection layer, and then we have our value projection layers. So the first thing basically that happens is we're gonna feed our hidden states to this linear layer, and it's gonna turn our hidden states into queries. Then also at the same at the same time we we uh, or sequentially actually we uh, feed our hidden states to the key projection layer, which produces these uh, keys. And then we also have our values, our value projection layer, um, which is also implemented using, well, in this case, GPT-2 leverages a convolutional 1D layer uh, in PyTorch, but actually in um, a, a convolutional 1D layer is equivalent to an in in dot linear. So actually, a lot of other models they just use uh, this which just represents a linear transformation um, and so each of the uh, so the hidden states gets projected to queries keys and values um, and then the next thing that happens is after projecting the hidden states to queries keys and values is we are going to uh, move on to the actual attention computation, which happens here. So then we are multiplying the queries by the keys. So 
<clears throat> like you might wonder like why did they come up with these with this query key value mechanism <clears throat> well basically uh, the way to explain it and this is actually also really illus uh, nicely illustrated in the illustrated transformer from J. Alamar is uh, basically we have some tokens some queries uh, and these are basically gonna ask like for information to pull from other tokens um, so basically for each of our six tokens we create a certain query vector um, and so a query vector just is gonna look for information from uh, the other tokens um, and so yeah basically we have our six tokens and for each of the six tokens we cr uh, create a corresponding query vector and the query vector is basically gonna uh, say hey I have this particular token like for example the token uh, hello uh, and I want to pull information from the other tokens in our input sequence so in this case could be world my name is or uh, the same token uh, hello <clears throat> and then it's gonna basically add information from those other tokens back to the input token so you can actually view attention very much like a weighted average of the existing token. So basically in this step, so again, each attention layer is just going to produce hidden states of the exact same shape. So we're going to end up here with uh, a tensor of shape, batch size, sequence length, hidden size. Um, and so the way this works is that we are going to first multiply the queries by the keys. So the next thing ha here that happens is we're gonna take the queries and the keys and we perform a torch.matmul. <coughs> so a matrix multiply. Uh, so let's print out the shape of that. So we call these the attention weights. As you can see here, we need to transpose the keys in order to perform the matrix multiply because transposing basically means that we're going to swap or switch these two dimensions such that we can multiply them. Um, and then, yeah, the shape of that is, as you can see, the following. So <clears throat> let's print that out. So the torch dot matrix multiply is going to produce um, attention weights, also called attention scores or logits. Um, and so in this case, they are of shape batch size, um, batch size, see, uh, sorry, number of attention heads, sequence length, and then also sequence length. Um, and so in our particular example, this is going to be 1, 12, 6, 6. Uh, and so basically what's happening here is every single token in our input sequence is going to look at every single other token. So we can actually create this as follows. So the attention matrix is going to be the following. So basically we have here our six tokens. Hello world, my name is. So basically we're going to have here hello my name sorry I forgot the word world hello world then we have the token uh, the comma which is a separate token in the vocabulary of the model Then we have uh, my name and so on. And then is, so we had six tokens. So the the attention matrix is gonna be of shape uh, six, six. Because we have six tokens. And so every single token is gonna look at every other token in the sequence. 
Um, and so every single number here in this attention matrix is just going to indicate like how how much attention that that token pays attention to for example this token so if you would have here a number um like minus 7.61 as just to give a random number that would just mean that the uh, token hello pays an attention of minus 7.61 to the token hello in the input sequence and then here it would be a different one uh, like 3.5 and so on these are just random numbers that i'm making up but the attention matrix is just a matrix of uh, shape sequence length sequence length because every single token is looking at <clears throat> every uh, other token of the sequence including its own token and so the reason that we call this self-attention is because uh, yeah the tokens are coming from the same sequence whereas if uh, the tokens would be coming from two different sequences then we call it cross-attention but that one deserves a different uh, video and so the attention matrix yeah, is basically gonna um, indicate with numbers how much attention the model pays from one token to another uh, and so on so we can actually print out those attention weights if you want to see them uh, of course they are not human interpretable anymore uh, but they are just numbers indicating how much every token pays attention to every other token uh, in the sequence um, yeah then I think the attention weights get scaled so I think that's probably gonna be set to true let's see if scale attention weights is set to true yeah it's set to true by default so we're gonna next scale them um, so after this operation we're gonna scale the attention weights that's another thing that was introduced in the attention is all you need paper. Uh, again, I think this was mainly for uh, training stability purposes. Um, so let's see how those are scaled. So basically what we do here is um, we uh, square them uh, to 0 0.5 in order to... Um, yeah, in, in order to scale basically the attention weights then those things here I think are not really done uh, so I'm gonna skip over them um, then yeah an attention mask is uh, performed so basically in the um, in the transformers library people cannot only pass the input IDs to a model like if you go to the plugging phase docs of GPT-2 uh, you will see that um, we can feed input IDs, but we can also feed an attention mask to the model. Uh, and so the attention mask here, this is actually also something that the, the uh, tokenizer creates for us. So let's actually um, feed not only the input IDs, but also whatever the tokenizer creates the model and you will see that it actually will probably also create um, the attention mask besides I hope I have removed my yeah so it will also actually uh, create uh, not only input IDs but also an attention mask and so the attention mask is just nothing more than so here actually we feed two things to our model not only input IDs, but also an attention mask, which is of the same shape, batch size sequence length. <coughs> um, and this is just um, indicating whether the model needs to pay attention to all of the tokens. So let's actually print out the attention mask. so let's see what we got so the tension mask in this case is all set to one so it basically means that every token is involved in the attention computation but actually sometimes we do have tokens that we don't want to be involved in the attention um, computation oh. and in that case you can actually uh, feed an attention mask of for example ones and zeros zero meaning the token should not 
be involved in the tension operation, whereas one means the token should be involved. Um, but that's, that is actually relevant here. Uh, after scaling the attention weights, we need to apply the attention mask. Um, and that's going to basically just rule out tokens that are not involved in the... But in our case, uh, it's not really uh, important because the attention mask is just all once, which means that the attention weights before and after applying this operation here are going to be the same. Um, but yeah, there are some uh, some use cases where we don't want tokens uh, to be involved, like padding tokens, which I also explained in my, my previous video. All right, and then after that, we need to perform a softmax operation. So yeah, apply the attention mask, rule out certain tokens. I really hate that Excali draw here is always. Uh, changing my in my arrows and then we apply a softmax so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna normalize the attention weight so as i saw as i explained here the attention weights they are still unnormalized like they don't really sum up to one so that's what we're gonna fix here with the softmax operator because a softmax basically takes in a sequence of numbers that are not normalized and it's gonna turn that into a uh, probability distribution basically is going to turn that into a sequence that sums to one. Um, so I need to probably expand my figure here because there are just too many operations involved in it in an attention layer. So then we apply the um, softmax operator on those attention weights. So now basically what we're going to have is after applying the softmax operator. Um, to get um, attention probabilities per token, basically. So what's happening here is that um, we basically uh, normalize them. So after the softmax operator, um, this attention matrix is then going to look like, for example, 0 0.03, um, and then, for example, 0 0.10, uh, and so on. And so and so on so this whole row here is going to sum up to one so you can actually then interpret it as a probability distribution for every single token so every single row is going to sum up to one um all right so that's that's what's happening next and then after <clears throat> after applying the uh, softmax operator yeah we again have a dropout layer which is relevant during during training to drop out certain tokens um and then finally the last thing that happens is we again perform a torch dot matrix multiply and so here we take the values and we multiply them by by the attention weight so here we finally take our values that we computed in the beginning and we multiply them by the attention weights and then what we get out is our attention output but the attention output is nothing more than the hidden states after performing this entire thing here um, all right, so yeah, I now explained basically all of the operations that are involved in a single attention layer of a single transformer layer. Um, so yeah, the reason for these queries, keys, and values is just um, basically what's happening is that uh, yeah, we we basically. Uh, turn every single token first into a query vector and then the query vector is just saying like hello I'm, I'm for example the token representing the word hello and I want to pull information from uh, all of the tokens in the input sequence and so in order to pull that information from the tokens in the input sequence that's what we are using these keys for so the keys are basically just uh, yeah representations of the tokens in the input sequence um, and by multiplying these queries and these keys, we basically get yeah, the attention weights, which basically are going to indicate how much a certain query token needs a certain key token. So it's basically just going to indicate how important one token corresponds to another one. Um, and then it's going to pull that information based on the attention weights from the values, which is just another projection of our input tokens. Uh, by then simply 
multiplying the attention weights with the values. Um, and so, yeah, this was just a very clever thing that was introduced in the attention is all you need paper. So basically we use first query representations. Uh, so these are just abstract representations of our tokens, uh, which represent like, hey, this these are the input tokens and I want to pull information from the other tokens. The keys basically then represent um, that you can pull information from from the, those tokens based on multiplying them we get certain attention scores out and then um, by applying a softmax we turn those attention scores into flat uh, distributions that sum up to one and then we can pull that information using the values so yeah you can basically view the whole attention layer uh, as sort of a weighted sum because every single token every single token is just going to update its its embedding vector we start from an embedding vector of size 768 for every single of the six tokens and each of those six tokens is just going to update its embedding vector by doing this uh, sophisticated um, operation of first turning the uh, embedding vector into a query vector the query vector uh, wants to pull information from all of the tokens for that it uses the keys and then based on multiplying the queries and the keys um, and then fetches the information from the values which are again yet another representation of each of the six input tokens in our sequence but i highly recommend to uh, read the illustrated self-attention uh, blog posts or the illustrated transform blog post uh, from Jay Elmar, which also explains some of the, yeah, intuitive things behind behind this whole operation of Christ keys and values. And then one additional thing that I didn't explain here yet is that we also have uh, separate attention heads. So basically, this whole operation that I explained here by creating queries, keys, and values, then uh, multiplying the queries and the keys to basically uh, see which tokens match best with other tokens and then pulling that information from the values that's actually going to be repeated uh, several times and so the number of times this is repeated is based on the number of attention heads which in the case of uh, gpt2 is 12 so we have actually 12 separate uh, query uh, representations 12 separate key uh, representations and 12 separate value uh, representations and the way to look at different attention heads is that basically um, they are all going to look for different things in the uh, in the sentence like one could be for example pulling information between tokens based on grammatical uh, correspondence others another attention head might pull information uh, based on like let's say location information and so on like each of these attention heads they can actually be uh, can have different uh, interpretations and can like look for different information um, in the tokens and that, that's one other reason why the uh, transformer is such a powerful model because so not only are we having this sophisticated operation with query keys and values uh, for input tokens but then also we are basically duplicating uh, that operation several times but yeah in PyTorch this is all done through uh, batched uh, matrix multiplications uh, so we don't actually need to do this in a for loop whatsoever. We can just, as you can see here, split the queries, the keys and the values for each attention head. And then because of the fact that, uh, so the hidden size of a GPT-2 model is 768 and we have 12 attention heads, that's, uh, that actually means that every single attention head is going to have a hidden size of 64. So that's why these queries, keys and values here have a final dimension of 64. Um, so yeah, there's there's quite a bit of course going on here, um, but yeah, that's basically uh, the way it works. And so then after this um, after this whole operation, we get our attention output, which is this shape, um, and then we basically just move on to our second layer norm, uh, which again takes in hidden states uh, of shape best size sequence length hidden size. It's gonna produce hidden states of the exact same shape. And then finally, we uh, apply a multi-layer perceptron, which is this this one here. Uh, maybe this this one also deserves its own 
its own diagram. So let's also explain that one in a bit more detail. So the multi-layer perceptron inside a transformer. Um, so again, it takes in hidden states of this shape and it's going to produce hidden states of the exact same shape. Um, and a MLP layer, what that's doing is um, it consists, well, again, this is implemented here using convolutional 1D layers, but for, us, for simplicity, let's use um, linear layers because those are actually equivalent. So let's call this the first fully connected layer. And then we have the second uh, fully connected layer. And then we also have a activation function. So this is the second fully connected layer So the first thing that happens is we feed our hidden states to the first fully connected layer. Again, we get hidden states out of the exact same shape. Then we apply our uh, nonlinear non activation function, which in the case of GPT-2, I think is the ReLU activation function. Uh, let's see, we can actually see that in the... Okay, so in this case, it's actually using the Galu new activation function, which is not the ReLU activation function. So yeah, activation functions is yet another thing uh, that I actually expect you to already know. Uh, this is actually heavily used in uh, in artificial neural, neural networks, uh, which basically allows the model to be a universal approximator. So basically allowing it to represent any uh, function, not only a linear uh, function. Um, so it could be ReLU, but it could also be like one of these newer variants like GLU and so on. Um, then we have our second fully connected layer uh, happening here. Yeah, th those have pretty terrible variable names here. They should actually be called something like fully connected one, fully connected two. And then we again have a dropout layer, which I'm going to add, um, not include here uh, for, s for simplicity reasons. But yeah, that's a bit what what is happening inside a single uh, multi-layer perceptron layer inside one transformer layer, which is then repeated 12 times. So yeah, this diagram is of course getting bigger and bigger, but yeah, this is actually what's happening uh, inside, inside uh, a single GPT-2 block, for example. So every single transformer layer or GPT-2 block consists of two layer norms. Um, every single layer norm takes in hidden states of shape, batch size, sequence length, hidden size. Um, it's going to produce hidden states of the exact same shape. Then we have this more sophisticated self-attention layer. But as I said earlier, um, actually the math behind it is, is still uh, quite simple. Like you only need to project your hidden states to three separate um, representations, so queries, keys, and values. Then the queries and the keys get uh, multiplied by each other to get the attention weights, which is this matrix over here, uh, indicating the correspondence between, between the tokens. And then we have the values, which basically then allow each token to pull information from the other tokens based on the strength defined by the attention weights. Um, and then after that, we have a second layer norm, and then we have our uh, multi-layer perceptor, which I explained uh, in more detail here. But yeah, the easy thing about transformers is that the input and output shapes are always staying the same, uh, just batch size, sequence length, hidden size. And yeah, we don't need to forget these residual connections, which are just adding the initial input back to the output. Uh, for training stability reasons. All right, and so, yeah, so the input of the next GPT-2 block is just the output of the previous GPT-2 block. So you can actually also see that in the in the code. So here, if we look into the for loop here where we iterate over these 12 transformer 
layers, uh, you will see that, yeah, basically we apply a block on the hidden states, we get the outputs, we take the hidden states back from that block, and then the same thing happens. We, we feed those hidden states back to the next uh, transform block and so on. All right, and then we have our final layer norm. So that's, that's this thing here. So let's call this the final layer norm. So this is again implemented using in and not layer norm in PyTorch. But again, uh, the shape is just the exact same thing. So it's gonna produce some other hidden states again um, of the exact same shape. And then we have already applied everything of the base model. So we typically uh, call a model that only produces hidden states a base model. So a base model, yeah, just creates embeddings for or tokens so in this case we have six tokens and we get embeddings out of size 768 uh, for each of the input tokens and then the very final thing we need to do in order to turn those hidden states into the logits is applying our language modeling hat so for that i'm gonna go here to the cell.lm hat which is the language modeling hat so we just are gonna feed our hidden states to it and it's gonna produce the logits um, and yeah, this language modeling hat is nothing more than another linear transformation. So here we get then the logits out, which are of shape batch size sequence length vocabulary size, which we saw uh, earlier in the video. So in our case, this is gonna be one, six, fifty thousand, two hundred and fifty seven. All right. Um, and so yeah, linear layer in PyTorch is nothing more than a uh, linear transformation so yeah this is just gonna be uh, basically a 768 times 50,257 uh, matrix which is, is just gonna project these vectors into another vector uh, but of a different uh, size all right so yeah and then we we end up with these logits uh, and so that's actually what what we get out of this as I also uh, showed here. So basically then uh, we went over all of the steps involved. So as you can see right here, these are the logits, batch size, sequence length, vocabulary size. And then we can get the next token uh, yeah, by taking the logits or the unnormalized scores of the final token and then um, perform an argmax operation. As follows. So, um, and then yeah, remember that this is still a token ID. So we would need to, um, yeah, turn that back into text. Luckily I have a uh, GitHub Copilot, which can help me with that. Uh, it could be, yeah, and then it produces the token John, which was explained here. So yeah, um, these are basically all the computations that are involved in each single transformer decoder. So you just need to keep in mind that it consists of first a few embedding layers that um, basically turn the input IDs, which are the integer, indices of the tokens into actual embedding vectors. We have both embeddings for the tokens themselves as well as for their positions. Um, and then we have a sequence of these transformer layers, typically 12 for a base sized transform, but nowadays with larger and larger language models, we not only increase the number of layers here, like we go from, for example, uh, 12 to 30 and so on. Uh, you, this was actually also nicely summarized in the GPT-3 paper where they yeah, scaled up these transformer models. Um, they went from, I think they had somewhere, yeah, here in this nice table where they scaled up the transformer model. And as you can see right here, yeah, they called this a small GPT-3 model, which consisted of 12 of these layers and a hidden size of 768, 12 attention heads. And this was then the hidden size per attention head. But then they scaled this up all the way to the GPT-3 model, which has 96 hidden layers. So 
96 of these blocks, as I explained, um, a hidden size that is more than 12,000, uh, 96 attention heads, and so on. Uh, so yeah, this is actually uh, yeah scaling up uh, transformer models massively, but the architecture itself just stays stays the same. The only things that change are the number of blocks that we that we have here, as well as the hidden size, which gets um, increased quite a lot. So instead of 768 numbers per token, we will have then uh, 12,000 and so on. So yeah, I, I hope that uh, this video was useful for you. Um, and yeah, in the next video, I might then explain what pass key values mean and how we can use them to speed up uh, autoregressive generation. All right.